I mentioned the analogy of um, the marketing space being like finance in the 1980s. I used the browser metaphor. Do you have any uh, analogies that you feel like are fitting, or do you agree with the Wall Street one about where we're at today with marketing? Yeah, I guess, I, I guess I'll start. Uh, thanks. Um, I don't necessarily agree with it because I think one of the biggest challenges that marketing is going through right now is one, it's an identity crisis. What exactly is marketing? And so where finance went through a renaissance and sort of uh, became more important, marketing is really going through a massive change of how deep do we go into sales? How deep do we go into service? Or quite frankly, what I'm getting from a lot of my sales colleagues is how deep do they come into marketing? So um, it's really challenging the very nature of uh, what marketing is, how you define it. You know, We all know the statistics about two thirds of the buying process is now done online before you ever engage with a sales rep which you would say you think that means more marketing, but the sales teams tend to be very uh, territorial about that. So um, there are some parallels, but I actually think the bigger issue is an identity crisis going on. So more like a rock star looking in the mirror and thinking about what their new, well, their new act is gonna be? There's, there's a branding problem in marketing, right? Is what is the brand of marketing and, and what is the value it brings and, and what is it supposed to do? And I know as I talk to fellow CMOs all over the place, none of us have the same definition or none of us have the same organizational structure. None of us even have the same naming convention for a lot of the, the roles that we have. So the first um, you know, thing that we need to do when you walk in as a CMO or when you're interviewing even as a CMO is, so what's included? Like what's the mandate? What's the mission? What's the structure? What's the, all those pieces? It's not, it's just not an assumption that you can make. Lynn, what do you think? I think actually it's the most exciting time to be in marketing. And if you look at uh, the Fortune 500 companies that were listed in the year 2000, more than half of them are now gone. Half of them no longer exist. So as companies, it is all of our imperative to continuously transform, to reimagine our business. And I think CMOs have that leadership role in reimagining what that business looks like. I do think CMOs own the brand, but that brand is now the customer experience. Yep. And the lines between sales and service and marketing are completely blurred because a customer doesn't care if you work in sales. They don't care if you work in service. They don't care if you work in marketing. They just want one consistent brand experience with you across every single touch point. Mm -hmm. And that's an opportunity for the CMO to lead. And I think it is, it, we are in a huge transition and a huge transformation. And I think it's an opportunity for CMOs to really lead their companies through this amazing transition that's happening today. Okay. Brian. Well, thanks. Uh, so I came at this from, uh, my first time experience was I was a banker and an analyst who ended up working in agency land for about eight years before now and back in a Wall Street role. Um, and around 2005, uh, 2006, there were a number of companies who were pitching ideas that were uh, riffing on uh, Wall Street based analogies. and. Anytime someone would ask, hey, can we find a Wall Street guy working in the agency world? And people came to me because there weren't that many of us. There were some, but not Because you used many. to be on Wall Street. Yeah. yeah. And they didn't realize I was a banker and an analyst. What did I know about trading? But that distinction didn't really matter. It's like, oh, he's a Wall Street guy. So I ended up meeting with a lot of these folks. And at the time, like I think of Ad ECN, which ultimately was bought by Microsoft and and, um, and right media. At the time, the, again, the metaphors they were using were all financial. So they definitely built these things with that concept in mind. And uh, that resonated with certainly the agency professionals who had never worked on Wall Street and thought, of course, it's going to be the same. Um, I saw more differences and similarities, but there are many similarities. Um, however, to be clear, um, you know, I observed that uh, the pace of change that financial services in some parts of financial services went through were significant and radical and revolutionary in some instances, um, in many cases because of regulatory change, which all of a sudden forced differences immediately. Immediately P&Ls were changed, immediately organizations were shifted and changed. And uh, technological changes also took root very quickly because cause and effect could be very clearly saw in, into the tunes of tens or hundreds millions of dollars or billions of dollars for individual entities. And so that change happened really quickly. Now, my primary job when I worked inside of Interpublic was to forecast global advertising. And I saw th through the lens of a couple of things. First, I uh, replaced or succeeded someone who started the same job in 1948. And I learned a lot from him when I tried to understand, you know, what did you do in the 1950s and 60s and 70s? 
television becoming an advertising medium in the 1950s was a revolution, a true revolution unlike anything the marketing world has ever seen. And you compare, when you re just read the source material, what happened in the 1950s to marketing and advertising, and you compare that to what happened with the internet and web and all things that have evolved in marketing in the last couple of decades, it's nothing. It's an evolution. And the important point is that while the customer doesn't care, to your point, I totally agree. Unfortunately, as I realized when I was trying to create these forecasts for advertising, the correct unit of analysis is not the consumer, it's the corporation. Because corporations are people. Corporations are people, as we know. But when you think of corporate analysis and how they make decisions, and you look at all the silos in organizations that still exist, and we can talk about breaking them down, and ultimately the vision that you guys are pursuing and that so many companies are trying to create is to you know, automate marketing in general, create a unified workflow, create, and the CMO is going to drive that over the course of decades. Absolutely, I'm a pure believer in that. But the silos are real, the incentives are different, organizational structures are complicated, and so change is very, very slow. And that's why it's more of an evolutionary thing, unlike the financial services industry, which would have been more revolutionary. But it's a really interesting hypothesis. I was going to ask you, Lynn, whether you agree with that, that television was completely transformative in a way that digital in the last 15 years pales in comparison to. Do you agree with that? Uh, I would. And I think now, um, I mean, we're in such an exciting time where you've got cloud, social, mobile, and now data science. And it's just an opportunity to now, as a small company, you can compete with the big boys, and the big boys need to completely transform their businesses. I mean, look at a company like Honeywell. Who would have ever thought five years ago that they'd be competing with Google now? Every, comp every single company needs to transform, and those companies that are trying to do it evolutionary, very slowly, breaking down their individual silos, I think those companies are not going to exist I, I, in 10 I, years. I don't disagree, by the way. Yeah, because <laughs> they need to... I, had, I hosted a CMO dinner last night and a lot of big brands yeah. talking about the silos, but what I'm seeing is a common theme around a CMO now owning service because the best marketing is great customer service and the best service is great customer, our best marketing is great customer service. So you're seeing these lines blur and you're seeing people own that customer experience throughout the entire company. And I think uh, we're just going to accelerate that Those who can that do pace. that organizationally, I think, are going to be well positioned to thrive. And to the point, I mean, we're, we're hearing about, you know, big beer. You know, I live in Portland, Oregon, right? The one city in the country, I think, where more than 50% of beer consumed is microbrew, right? We have 60 microbreweries. Go Portland. Um, but big beer is all worried about losing share to the micro guys, right? And you see this in cereals. And you see this category after category after category. And to your point that the marketers that can't break down their silos, and maybe any won't, and they're just going to just fade away. Chris, do you agree with that, that like the micro brands are just imp as empowered as the big brands to compete today? Well, oh, there's no question the barriers to entry have come radically down. Um, I would probably argue that the, the change in television, to go back to the analogy, was one, because you added a whole new sense to it, right? The change that we've seen now, which hasn't been as dramatic in an individual innovation, but I would probably argue over time is even a bigger innovation, is now we are engaging, we are interacting. Whereas TV was a broadcast medium, yeah. what we're doing now actually is we're interacting. It's a conversation that you're getting involved in. And the interesting thing is I think organizational change. Look, I work for a company that probably most of you have never even heard of. We're a 170 year old industrial company that has become one of the top software companies in the world. Um, that you probably don't even know that, right? We, I was talking beforehand, we have a $300 million software as a service business. You can't change the organization fast enough to adapt to what's going on. So there's a problem in terms of, by the time you get to the organizational change, it's usually too late, at least in large organizations. And this is where the smaller companies can move faster because organizational change doesn't involve 180,000 people like we have around the world, right? It involves a much smaller. So coming back to the first topic we were talking about, and I would totally endorse what Lynn was saying is, that ambiguity suddenly creates an opportunity, right? It's a difficulty, but it creates an opportunity for an organization full of what Google would call smart creatives, right? People who understand the business, who understand the customer, who understand the technology, the process. And there aren't too many organizations inside a, a company that actually can do that like marketing can, usually. And so there's an opportunity there for marketing to play this Again, it's a different role in every single company. What Lynn's marketing organization does is very different than what mine does, but the purpose is suited for the, uh, the situation, the environment that we're in, 
right? And so the marketing organization is sort of evolving to take that, and that offers a leadership position that has to go faster than organizational change. Uh, it has to engage people in the organization in internal communities. I mean, one of the things that we've focused on is internal kind of change management before we ever change the organization. Because we're worried about, we compete with Google in that same area that Honeywell does, right? We're competing with a lot of specialists all around the world, and you know we're a big industrial company that has to adapt like that. We have to do it faster than organizations can, can map to. I'd like to go to the framing question of the panel, actually, which is what, what the issues are in marketing that nobody's talking about and will not talk about. Could, could we go, could I start with you, Brian, sure. say just a single one, what is the thing that marketers are not talking about, but they need to be I, I mean, I, 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 not to just continue with what we've said, but it is this organizational design issue. I think that marketers don't realize that, um, frankly, how powerless many of them are inside their own organizations. I think that, you know, um, while there are many CMOs who are uh, very important in their own organizations, I would say there are a significant, dare I say, majority who are not. And if the CEO uh, and the top of the company doesn't uh, prioritize marketing and doesn't just give someone a CMO title because it sounds good, but actually empowers marketing as a demand generator, as a driver of long-term growth. Well, you end up with a CMO whose primary job is to socialize change, but has no power to make change happen, mm. unless the CEO wills it. And at the end of the day, they need someone who's kind of evangelizing internally. So what change is that? So they just... I think, to Lynn's point, they go away. I mean, over time, if, you, if marketing is critical to your category and you don't do this sufficiently well, uh, I think that the company that does it better takes share and wins. I think in other categories, by the way, when I worked in agencies, this didn't sound so good, but I don't care now. Marketing doesn't always matter. I, I totally disagree with okay. that. But <laughs> in some categories, I'm just arguing. But go, please. Well, if you think about... And if you define, I think it gets back to your definition of marketing. If you define marketing as being wherever a customer touches your brand and providing an amazing brand experience with that customer, whether that's on your website, in your store, on their phone, through the app, through a stadium, wherever that customer touches your brand, social networks, as a CMO, you need to be where that customer is. You need to know who that customer is, what they like, what they've sure. purchased. You need to take them on a journey across all those different touch points. And that's where I think the role of marketing is becoming even more important uh, in the organization. I, and that's, it, no. again, can be. Can but be. it can be. That's can the be. point. It, I think always. it's a strategy. Yeah. It's not necessarily the only strategy. Look at Xiaomi. How much money? Now, we could argue, argue Xiaomi is um, marketing in its own way. How much do they spend on? paid advertising, nothing. I mean, if you build a really good product, it is possible in some categories that that's where your resources should go, and the marketing will follow itself. Now, is that a good long-term strategy? You have to look company by company, category by category. I'm just saying it's not necessarily the case that it'll always be true that it There are a lot of sales administration teams out there in the B2B world. There are a lot of advertising teams that call themselves marketing. There's no question about it. But we started to look at, um, you know, where companies had the largest uh, valuation and actually where marketing, it, it, I, I don't have scientific information yet, we're still in the middle of this, but where marketing is actually perceived as a core part of the company, my instinct says you're gonna find that that valuation is higher because you're making that switch from, uh, you know, saying what your product does or what your offering does to why. It exists, right? You're able to get through, break through the clutter and the chaos. You're able to now start look at interactions. But I would probably agree with you that most are not in that position yet, and that's right. that goes back to sort of even some of the roles and people and 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 backgrounds that some of us have, right? Don't fit. I do think though it does need to come top down. So the CEO, it needs to be completely a leadership decision yep. that says we are going to be a customer centric company. We are going to focus on the customer and we're gonna really understand that customer and have an incredibly engaging experience with that customer across everywhere that customer touches our brand. But what happens when a CEO is uninnovative and does not define marketing as broadly as you do? And I would leave the company. But, yeah. <laughs> but there are different, there are yeah. different ways to compete. Yeah. I mean, seriously, like, do you wanna work at a company where a CEO does not prioritize 
customers and the customer's experience as, if not the most important thing, one of the most important things in the company. I mean, I, I would definitely make the case, and if, if that CEO does not budge, then as an entrepreneurial CMO, I would recognize that that company is not gonna be in business in five to 10 years. And, and that is the challenge all of us, I think, who, who like to consider ourselves you know, progressive in that uh, do run into, because there's a fine balance between the CEO who believes he or she is the chief marketing officer, and we have a lot of, I think we've all worked for somebody like that in our background, right, who believes they are the chief marketing officer, then the job of the CMO and title is to execute the orders of the CEO. And I don't think that's quite where you're going. No. What you're talking about is a CEO who really recognizes the value of owning that customer experience, of articulating it in a way that can be simple but, but lead to the, all the complexities of what actually needs to go on in terms of delivering value. And there are some CEOs who just go, you know better than I do, go take it on. Very few of those, right? Most of them are sort of somewhere muddling in the middle, um, and that's where you have to find that balance, right? You have to find that spot where the CEO does consider it important, whether it is getting the awareness out or understanding what, what your company does or, or owning the, the brand experience. Yeah. You have to put it in the context of how companies and, and in the industry industries are changing. Um, I've, I've characterized the you know, creative destruction of the economy and of marketing in general in the, the notion that, okay, 30 years ago, 70% uh, of mass media spending was local advertising and 30% was national as I've defined it. Now that's flipped. 70% national, 30% local. It's not because all of a sudden the like for like advertiser decided national is more efficient than local. It's because um, I, I argue that Dwight D. Eisenhower is the, the godfather of modern media and advertising. Like, Dwight Eisenhower, what? The interstates. The interstates turned the United States from a collection of economic regions into one economic nation for the most part. Interstates begat retailers operating at a national rather than regional level, begat manufacturers operating at a national, if not international level, begat consolidation to the point of oligopoly, oligopoly creating uh, marketers who are mostly self-referential in how they allocate their budgets and make decisions. And at the other end, the rise of the internet, making it possible to be that small 20-person company, outsourcing everything as much as possible, shipping one, all your goods to Nevada so Amazon can deliver everything. The point is that that creative destruction, if you will, has created the condition where different marketing choices end up predominating based on the composition of companies in the economy. That middle's been hollowed out, right? So you end up with a whole bunch of companies where if you've got a 20-person company, what is marketing? You don't, maybe you don't have a CMO. You don't have someone who's in charge of marketing. To your point, all the touch points of the customer are marketing. The product is marketing. The distribution is marketing. And maybe people aren't thinking in the way that we characterize marketing. But, but I would argue that this may be, um again, comes back to this definitional question, is talking about marketing as a function versus marketing as an organization. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of marketing functions which are held in groups that aren't called marketing. And we all know sort of the core trends, like historically, we've looked at transactions, and now we're looking at interactions. And interactions vastly increases the data, right? The speed, the amount of information that's available, the buyer's journey has gotten more complex. Um, somebody told me the other day, the idea of demographics is over. It's a demographic of one. Yeah, it's a right? one. Everyone wants a personalized one-to-one -one experience. And I think the, the challenge and the opportunity for CMOs and CMOs is to provide that one-to-one -one experience and do that at scale. Yep. Especially now with all the data that we have, to be able to take that data, use that data, understand that data, and make inferences. If that was true, why would, the television, why would television advertising be su the largest category, such a large category still? If everyone wants a one-to-one -one It's experience. possible. To your point, you can compete and win and do better than your competitors if you take that approach and you design your organization, this customer-centric notion of start your design of your organization through the lens of the consumer, right? That's absolutely a great way to compete and probably win. The problem is that's really hard to do. Well, but it's also, it's a blunt instrument to some degree. Yeah. I mean, it's a hammer, right? And if you've got enough money, if... You know, one of our challenges I mentioned is reaching awareness. And so the first thing, if anybody says, well, how are you gonna change awareness? Give me a whole bunch of money, I can do television advertising. But really the best way to do it is, is there's a much more cost effective way, but it requires a whole lot more effort. So we work with contractors, electricians, right? The salt of the earth kind of people. And we have to get to them. And the way we're getting to them is not through advertising on, on television and broadcast, and even not so much on online. It's really much more about 
providing digital tools, right? Some of the stuff that you guys actually help us do in terms of the CRM or the applications, the configurations, find a partner here, do all these. I mean, these are 40, 50 year old, blue collar, right? Don't yet understand that IT is about to knock their world, you know, and, and the convergence of IT, OT. But that's how we're getting to them. That's, that's harder, but less expensive. And sometimes people are actually willing to just go, you know what? Just throw some money at it. Deal with the wastage. Go to TV. It's the I, I agree totally. That's that's exactly why. Yeah. Um, we're gonna go to Q and A in one second. We're gonna ask pan panels throughout the day um, a question and bring together what they think, so we people can leave with kind of a coherent view of what um, what the message is from today. Um, what do you think, if you could ask, if each of you could ask for one thing, or Brian, in your case, if marketers could ask for one thing from their CEO, what would it be? For me, it's to recognize that marketing is actually a skilled position. It's not, it's, <laughs> You're skilled, man. <laughs> it's, 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 not a, it's not just a random athlete who gets to spend some time and, and can anybody can do it, right? I, I'm constantly in this conversation about, well, let's get somebody who knows our business to do that job. And, and so it really is, marketing is not just anybody can do it if they had more time. Mind you, the tools have sort of democratized, and so now everybody is doing marketing. But there is a functional expertise, or uh, and if I could get that sort of recognition, I think I'd be in a lot better situation. Lynn, I think it's it's something that I touched on earlier, which is um, thinking about how, when if I'm talking to my CEO, how our company can connect with our customers in entirely new ways across every single touch point, and what that means is functionally. We're going to have to work together to provide one cohesive customer experience because, again, customers don't care if we're in sales, service, or marketing. All those functions are really organ uh, blurring from a customer standpoint. Um, sounded a little bit contradictory. Accept ambiguity and challenge the data. And what I mean by that is um, I'm aware of a number of the largest marketers on earth who have made very public pronouncements about shifts of spending into digital, where, so far as I can tell, the rationale was primarily um, because it sounded good. Uh, it's branding. Right. And it, well, it sounded good in talking to Wall Street. It sounded good in talking to, uh, well, they believe things, but they didn't challenge the data. And they maybe don't accept that, you know what, the marketers can't always prove their choices. Um, but even they're just trying to save their jobs in some but, cases. At this point in time, I do feel like as marketers, we have more tools in front of us to basically show the ROI from what we do. So measuring our investments, looking about, looking about where we're putting our dollars, what type of return we sure. get on that. We, we have the but tools. They're not always in. picking the right data, and they're not always picking the right tools to make the analyses. They're not always including all the data. And they're not using, they're not balancing gut and data where needed. Because we're still learning. I mean, yes, we're still learning. But that's how to that's tools. having a hypothesis. But that's the accept ambiguity it. that and, you don't know, yeah. but you feel this is the right answer, and let the marketer's gut. Such ultimately. a simple question, such a complicated answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys can continue. Yeah, we're still debating. We're talking about <laughs> <laughs> coffee talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's open it up for questions right here in the third row. Do you mind saying where you come from before you say your question and your name? So we've got a set of conversations here around how marketing is being affected by the fact that it's surrounded by a bunch of other functions and they're encroaching on each other's territory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to suggest that's the weeds. Um, at the World Economic Forum, the biggest risk was water. The MDG that's furthest behind is sanitation. There's these global problems that are going to change the way companies operate that's going to change every function. What's your, could you say? So you. we're at the time Warner Building, Melinda Martin published an article saying companies will not survive if they do not solve huge problems. So my question is, should marketers be more concerned about aligning their companies with solutions to problems that will change the world versus identify this customer and target this bid to buy this piece of we, stuff. We should, absolutely, and, and, and you hit on something. I mean, I think Lynn did a good job of articulating, you know, focus on the customer. What you're talking about is what I would call those low trajectory but very high impact trends. 
And so for us, it's urbanization, right? 50 years ago, a third of people lived in cities, now about half. In another 50 years, it'll be at least two thirds. Digitization, we're talking about everything moving online and what that does. Um, industrial revolution, right? Taking efficiency, sustainability, uh, IT and operational technology all coming together. Those are all huge, massive trends that businesses do have to uh, adapt to and have to look long term. And I would argue those three in particular for us are the things that drive us and keep us awake every night. The difference is though, it's very hard to balance between the low trajectory long term impact and the day to day, I got to make enough profit to get me to the next level where I can go. So I'm, I'm going to be around in five years. Yeah. I mean, to your point, I do think that we, as companies and as corporations, we need to be focusing on the bigger picture. And one of the things that we do at Salesforce is we have the one, one, one model, where 1% 1 1 of our employees' time, 1% of our product, and 1% of our equity goes back to the community. So as an employee, I can give six days, any, any employee in the company can give six days of volunteer time to whatever cause they find is most important. We've given close to a million hours of employees' time 80 million in grants and more than 25,000 not-for-profits run their organizations on Salesforce for free because we want to give back and, and look at the bigger picture in terms of the worldview. Anyone who's been to Dreamforce, I mean, that's always been incredibly clear. I mean, uh, the notion of triple bottom line companies, I think, are incredibly important in this regard. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, Facebook, another company, I, I, I cover Salesforce, the stock, I cover Facebook, the stock. Um, and it's interesting, an analyst asked a question uh, on, on the last earnings call about why exactly Mark Zuckerberg is talking so much about internet.org. What exactly does this have to do implicitly with this quarter's earnings? And um, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's a governance question. Um, and it is broader than marketing, but it, to the extent that the company is the product to some degree and your ability to sell is dependent upon your perception and your long-term viability, I think there is some relevance around um, making sure that you, as a company, have a stand uh, around what you think is important to the world. That said, it's so intangible to an investor. I think, I, I dare say that few investors appreciate the triple bottom line concept even. In the short um, term. They should, but the they don't. In the short term they don't, but, but I think everybody's starting to recognize this, you know, people, planet, profit kind of connection, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the drive that The that long has. term is bene benefits from it, absolutely. But the question is different, whether investors appreciate it versus whether consumers appreciate it. And if every company is In the long term, making... consumers will though, I think because at the end of the day, it, like when I say governance, I mean at a high level. Yeah. It's the idea like when things go wrong, not if, when they go wrong. In say there was a scandal involving a company or some, they made a major mistake, data breach or something else. Are consumers willing to give them the benefit of the doubt? If you believe that the company, by and large, has a broader sense of interest, then from a marketing perspective, this stuff does matter, I think, in the long run. I do. Well, we, we talk about not just shareholder value, but stakeholder value. We're all stakeholders in our community, in our world, in the cities that we live, in the schools that we send our children to. And it's taking that much broader view. So it's taking it from stakeholders and not just shareholders. Lynn, we have a question for you um, through our app, which is, can you please help define the role of the CEO in delivering superior customer experience if the CM and if the CMO should own that function? The role of the CEO should recognize the importance of the customer experience in the company and to be a customer-focused company. Um, it doesn't mean that the CMO has to own every single function that touches a customer, but what they have to do is provide and facilitate how you're going to have that customer experience across every single function. So connecting sales, connecting service, connecting marketing, for example, so that you all, every single function, has a 360 de degree view of the customer so that you can understand, hey, if that customer is calling my service desk, my service team knows that we've sent them these emails and that they've actually posted this information on Twitter and that they've talked about us. That service agent has all that information. So again, it doesn't mean that the CMO or marketing needs to own every single function. It's that at the CEO level, there needs to be an awareness that the customer experience is incredibly important and that as a company, we need to work across our silos to have that unified customer experience. And we have a lot of data. How and when should we purge it? Mm -hmm. um, Brian. Well, uh, I mean, it's really interesting from the vantage point of, uh, we were touching on this earlier, like uh, theoretically it's possible to model out, you know, a marketing mix model can tell you what media is working, what's not. Um, 
unfortunately, if you don't choose the right data over the right amount of time, you can make terrible uh, conclusions. And so there's a very subjective element as to what matters. So through the lens of uh, how data can be used to drive more marketing effectiveness, frankly, you need as much as you can legally and safely from a consumer vantage point keep uh, to make it work, in my opinion. I think we're at such an amazing time with data. 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. But, but 90%. Can I push back? Yeah. One observation I had when they, I was uh, amused to learn, but not surprised when you know, the subprime crisis occurred. Uh, when I saw some of these models uh, you know, before the crisis broke, and I realized they were using data from only 2002 to 2007. And it's no different than, you know, I'm, I'm also a chart financial analyst and, and is going through that process. I couldn't help but notice that all the academic theory in for, informing modern finance is based on data from 1930 to the present, or 1930 to 2000, whenever. So it's as if 1929 was a one-off. It never happened again. It couldn't possibly be every 60 years something happened. From a marketing standpoint, though, do you it's think that people No, you need cycles. Yes, you need cycles. Yeah, but, it, we're, you know, we're, there's, a, there's so many tools out there today now, and we're just learning how to do it. I would yeah. argue that... A bigger set of data managed well just improves your... But if you don't have history, yeah, you lose you could... context and you'll miss out on the uh, bigger... Data yeah. is totally useless unless you can get that inference from it and to ask the right questions. And you don't always know what the right questions to That's ask are true. at the time. And, and sometimes the biggest gains can be made by ignoring what the data says. I agree. Right? So, so there's no such, at least I don't believe, my personal opinion, I don't believe there's th such thing as a perfect set of data. So it can get better and better and better, mm -hmm. and the models can improve, and the models can get better, and the assumptions change, but the customer's pretty dynamic. The consumer's yeah. pretty dynamic in what they do and how they interact, and, and you know, it's just, it's a... Um, but even just yeah. the basic stuff of if I called your help desk or I went into your store, and then I accessed your company through my mobile device. Those, that data should be- it Should be consistent. Consi it should same, be consistent. Yeah. It should be available to all those people that are touching that customer. But at what point do you keep it history forever? Matters, or what, so your point is history matters, but you can't keep well, data storage forever. Well, storage is also getting yeah. a little easier. Yeah, so you can keep it. You can. Yeah, so you, you think you re that was would be what you would recommend? I don't think you market. have to. Again, I think it just will inform what you're doing yeah. better, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this is still a tool. There's still a human element to it. We haven't mapped the human decision-making criteria such that we can do an A plus B equals C equals D, right? I mean, we, we're, we're still... But that's the beauty of marketing. That's the beauty of, of really business. It's constantly testing, and that's the whole premise of entrepreneurial. You're constantly testing, right. constantly trying, invest, test, test, invest. If it fails, fail fast. If it doesn't, double down. And you have hypotheses you know, the gut level, maybe from a marketing standpoint, that, okay, I'm gonna, I think A plus B is gonna equal C, well, then you test it. And now you have the data to actually say, okay, I'm gonna do some A-B testing to see what works better, B works better. You know, okay. a lot of us grew I, up. I wanna get one, so no, no, finish, and then I want I was just gonna question. say, you know, a lot of us grew up in the world of, of, especially in the tech industry, Jeffrey Moore and the whole inside the tornado and crossing the chasm and all that kind of stuff. And I read all the books, the only thing I retain constantly in my brain is that at every stage of development, you throw away your old strategy and you adapt to your current environment. And I remember that sort of going, don't hold on too long to that strategy and those assumptions. You have to change based on where your environment is. That's We, we have a saying at Salesforce, tactics drive strategy. Yeah. It's, it's that constantly saying what works, what, let me test it, let me test it. And That's working, yep. that becomes our strategy. Yep. One more question from the audience. Um, Right there, the third row. Thank you. Romy Encarnacion. I'm a business consultant. I, uh, I have been focused in Eastern Europe. Anyway, talking about what is marketing, uh, is it a function? Is it an organization? Initially, when, when I started training marketers, I thought it was simply marketing is general management, meaning it is leadership and it is financial accountability. And, there, and then this genius came, and he added a third dimension. It's about human empathy. And the genius is no other than Steve Jobs. In other words, I was waiting to hear that marketing is not just a function or an organization, especially in how it relates to the CEO. If a marketer understands that marketing is general management, 
he would understand that there are the basic elements of leadership and financial accountability. And like in any organization, there is always the need to manage upward. The ability to manage the CEO is very important, and the CEO will react positively if he or she understands that the, that the CMO understands those two basic things. Do you mind asking your question because we're running out of time? Yeah, well, I was just going to ask, can we uh, define marketing broadly, covering those three points? Thank you. So I, I would think that uh, now we're getting into customer centricity in general, right? And, and sort of a mentality rather than a specific function. And just like finance kind of as a function and whatnot. The, 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 I, I think what you're bringing to the table in that question is the idea of the profile of people who are executing on marketing, doing marketing, determining marketing strategies, whether they sit in a group called marketing or not, is changing, right? You know, we all love Mad Men and we love to see sort of the advertising world come up. And then you had, in the tech world, you had that whole product marketing dominated, right? All the CMOs were essentially engineers who somebody, I mean, I remember Larry Ellison uh, talked to one of my old CMOs, bosses, and sort of said, hey, you know something about you know, the customer. Why don't you become the CMO of the company? And Mark suddenly was the CMO. Um, now that profile is very different. And that profile is, is very multidisciplinary. And I think this comes back to the heart of what we're talking about in the entrepreneurial CMO. Given the ambiguity, given the new tools, given the new models that are coming out, given the change in customer behaviors, given the convergence of B2B to B2C, of industrial to technology, all those kind of things, the multidisciplinary nature of not just the individual, but the team is critical. And you know, I, I've been in my job now about 15 months, and, and the very first thing I focused on was the people around me. Because I knew there were certain skill sets that I had, and there were certain skill sets that I didn't have. And I needed to round that out because I needed financial discipline. I needed creative understanding. I needed technology. You know, I needed operational excellence and all those kind of things. So there's no question that that multidisciplinary is coming into marketing. I think it's coming into a lot of other functions as well. Marketing's probably just more used to it. Right? We're used to that ambiguity more. No, I think that's a great summary. I think of CMOs are GMs. I think the next CEOs that you see coming up will be from CMOs because you have to have that interdisciplinary uh, control and purview and also the financial. Every investment you make, uh, you should be looking at what your return is. If I invest X, where am I going to put it? How am I going to help drive the business? And I think CMOs are looking more and more at the top line revenue. What, am, what does my organization do? Yeah that's gonna be driving that revenue. Um, and it's, it's much more of a GM role than it's ever been. Absolutely. Lynn, I'm gonna let that be the last word. Don't forget, you heard it here first. Forget David Ogilvy, it's Dwight Eisenhower, who's the founder of <laughs> Modern Marketing. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.